Okay, we're good. <laughs> we're good to go. So welcome to uh, another edition of Mixtape Monday. Uh, let me. How many times can I say that? How many times can I say that? Well, I'm gonna say it six times today, folks. What's up, Mike? Feeling? Yeah, that's how many times I'm gonna say it. Mixtape Monday. Mixtape Monday right. with Mike Dillon. What's up? <laughs> Oh my gosh, so super um, excited to have you on the show. Thank you for being a part of this. Um, I'm really glad that we were able to go live on Facebook too. So hopefully we can get some people participating and, and getting those, uh, those comments out there and all that good stuff. Um, so normally I introduce people, but I really just wanna let you introduce yourself because you're such a badass motherfucker. Hi, my name's Mike, and I play things. <laughs> who's, your, who's your furry friend? This is Beignet. Beignet, uh, Beignet doesn't like it when I play really loud music, which is what I do all the time. Oh, but, well, Beignet, meet um, Tadpole. Hi, Tadpole. You got a punk rock haircut. Oh, Beignet, my. Beignet had a mohawk last summer. Oh, did he really? <laughs> uh, so I kind of gave everybody an introduction earlier when I posted in Sunshine and the Bass Kids because I wanted everybody to kind of get their heads wrapped around how many artists that you've worked with previously. Um, you are a multi-instrumentalist. Is that how you would say the, the word? I'm a multi-instrumentalist. Yes, indeed. Multi-instrumentalist. Okay. Um, and you played with, uh, first person that comes to mind, obviously, is Les Claypool. Um, you've been playing a lot with Ricky Lee Jones lately, I've, I've noticed. Yeah. I love her. Um, I have an old vinyl of hers from like the 80s, I think. Um, and she used to play with Willie Nelson is how I learned of her. Um, you've also played with Carl Denson. You've played with um, so many people. I mean, I can't even like really wrap my head around it, but could you kind of just give us an introduction to um, all the different groups and people that you've been blessed to play with? Yep, I would say first off was my old Texas group, Billy Goat, that was in the before that, Tin Hands. These are the Texas groups. Billy then, Goat! And after no. Billy Goat, we started Harry Apes BMX. And right about that time, Harry Apes BMX was going on. There was Critters Buggin', which Skerrick started in the late 90s, about the same time. They were already going, but they brought me in. And that was with Brad Hauser on bass from the New Bohemians. And then um, after the Harry Apes, Went for a while until like 2006. And then and that was, I met you about 2004. With the yeah. 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 With Clark and Spies and JJ Jungle. Oh, JJ Jungle. Um, yeah. yeah, I have to just mention, um, I was talking to a buddy the other day too, and it seems like the common um, interest in a lot of these um, conversations is squirrel because we would have never met each other if it wasn't for the famous Dr. Rocket's Blues Bar in Corpus Christi, Texas. Yeah, on Sunday night, they would let the freaks take over and Squirrel yeah. booked it and Monkey's doing it and the Harry Apes would play shows together. And it was a beautiful scene there. And you know, at about that time, I'd already started playing with Claypool with the Frog Brigade and, with, and Carl Denson. Play with, sat in with Galactic and play with those guys a lot as far as the jammers. And then, you know, from there went to like Ani DeFranco and uh, the Dead Kenny G's, Garage La Trois, a bunch of groups. And, you know, and a, a lot of those bands were amazing bassists. You yeah. know, we talked about JJ and Les, of course. With Ani DeFranco, there's this great bassist named Todd Sikafus that's in his band. I mean, in her band, and then um, um, with Carl Denson, there was Chris Stillwell, amazing bassist, and then Ron Johnson was in Carl's band. That was who was in it at first, and then Ron 
Um, moved down to New Orleans. And then, like, you know, then I moved to New Orleans right about 2006. And there, you know, started just playing with all these different New Orleans bands. Maybe not touring with them, but sitting in with them, doing stuff with the great bassist James Singleton, who lives in New Orleans. We started some different bands together and got to play a few gigs with George Porter Jr. at the Maple Leaf from the Meters, you know, George. What a, what a great basis. And um, then, you know, somewhere along that way, I started my band with Carly and those guys, the Mike Dillon band, after the Go-Go Jungle, which was JJ and Go-Go Ray. And one night when JJ didn't play with us, you rocked it with us in Houston, Texas. Yeah, yeah. That was so much fun. I'll never forget that. We did a, it was a festival in Houston. That's right. It was a festival. Yeah. Festival. With Spoon Fed Tribe. With the Spoon Fed, our homies. Yes. That was so much fun. Oh my God. We had a blast that night. You know, and that takes us back to Squirrel. I mean, before COVID happened, I think we were all trying to figure out how to do some gig down in, Another thing he was putting together. Yeah. I mean, he was calling me and like going, all right, I'm trying to get you down here. And I was calling Hauser. I was trying to get a group together and figure out how to get down there and do it. And then also, and I just finished the tour with my band. I was going to have a few weeks off and then go right back out. I'm like supposed to be just getting back from Europe right now. Yeah. You know, I was going to play with Ricky Lee in Europe and then do like a week with Clutch. I was going to play with those guys. Wow. Well, I've been, I've, JP and I have, have become good friends. And I played on their last record. And I mean, I love those guys. They've had my band out open for them several times over the past, since shit, 2014. That's crazy. Like, time is <laughs> flying. Like, it seems like it was yesterday we were all hanging out at Rockets. I know. You know, it was a really special time to be alive um, back in those days. I mean, still, it's a very special time to be alive. Um, that was, you know, a good point that you brought up about how you were supposed to just be getting back from Europe. Um, as long as I've known you for the many, many, many years, you know, that we go back, you've always been on the road. Like, I've never known you to be home more than, like, two to three days at a time. So, you know, for somebody like you, who's just consistently just burning the road, how does it feel now to just kind of be, you know, at home, live streaming, not playing the live shows anymore, not connecting really with the fans so much? Um, how has that affected you? And how are you dealing with that? It's funny, with some things, when you have change, you're like, it, it just seems like the hardest thing to deal with. And then other things, it's no big deal. Um, sometimes changing people, like band members has been ultra hard. Changing relationships has been ultra hard. But the pandemic was one of those things was like, okay, we're, there's nothing we're gonna do about this. There ain't no changing it. There ain't no getting back pre-corona. So it was just like instantly like, all right, we're gonna adopt this and figure out a way to stay creative. And write it, you know, I always love writing music. I, whenever I get home from tour, it takes me a day to sleep and become a human again. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of coffee I, too, huh? And then I pump the coffee and I start writing, practicing and writing. And it would be like three days. If I had a week at home, wow, I might even write six or seven songs. But it's always been a hurry. So you always have so much energy, six or seven songs. Oh my god! <laughs> so when it became obvious, like, oh wow, they're canceling everything. We're going to be home, and after we got over the initial fear of like, how are we going to live? Uh, where's the? Ah. Luckily, I had a bunch of merch left over from the tours that I was supposed to do, and there's Venmo and Bone Loaf, and even you bought a T-shirt. I just sold T-shirts, saved up some enough money to pay rent for a while. Yeah. Like, all right, here we go. Let's see what happens. Yeah. The writing. And then when I did my first live stream, I was like, whoa, this is really cool. People send you Venmos and tip you and are really gracious. And wow. Oh, but God, the stream froze up on me four times. My mom <laughs> beer was texting me going, well, your Instagram videos have been really good, but your live stream sucked. 
Get it. Shout, shout out got to it. Mama D. Shout out to Mama D. She's always keeping it real. Beer, beer was blowing up Peregrine's phone going, what is wrong with y'all? This is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so funny. And we're just like, God, Mama, we're trying to figure it out. You know, and like, so that was like a big process and it became, okay, I guess streams are, you know, and the first one was so weird. It was like, cause we just used the phone, but we didn't have a good internet here at the, at the, at the place yet. So it was constantly freezing up and then we're like, okay, we got to figure this out. Then we got some cameras. I bought a zoom camera from guitar center. It took forever to get here. And then it froze up the first one. So it was always like figuring out this new technology. And then all of a sudden, everyone just got, everyone started doing streams. And then I figured, felt like the streams just sort of sucked. Oh, shit. You know, like as soon as like I got at a decent quality of doing them on the technical side, it got nice outside and people started going outside. And it went from being like, being a regular gig where you might make a couple hundred bucks playing at your house to like, all right, there was $15 in the Venmo for tonight's performance. Yeah. And it was still fun, but then it became just like almost real life gigs. Yeah. Where it was like, <laughs> not every gig is sold out. All right, it's a Monday night in Des Moines. We got 10 people here and they, <laughs> well, your, your tab is uh, greater than your door <laughs> proceeds. You owe us money. <laughs> okay. So, you know, it, it, in a weird way, it's all been the same. And then like you have another stream and you're just like, Oh my God, a lot of people tuned in. I can pay my insurance. That's what happened two weeks ago. I thought they were done. And I had an eight, you know, I couldn't pay all of it, but I had a really good day. Yeah. You know, it just seems like no matter what, somehow shit takes care of itself. Yeah, man. And it's, you know, and, and it's, you know I, now I'm 54. I've been doing this music game forever. I can remember like after having a band that had a record deal and touring <laughs> and making great money, you know, three to five grand a night because Billy Goat was popular, all of a sudden to like everything dying. And that was in the 90s off five to $10 covers. None of this $30 cover shit. <laughs> you know, it was like, I remember people started charging 10. That was a lot of money. Yeah. But so, and then all of a sudden, the next thing I know, I'm working at labor ready to try to make rent, you know, and, and, and working just painting houses, doing whatever I could. Yeah. But that's when I was in my 30s. So now in my 50s, you know, I'm like trying to, I'm like trying to file for unemployment and figure it out just like all the rest of us. You know, and some of my friends that are younger have gotten jobs already. Like Nathan from my band is a US postman now. Like literally, he got hired by the postal service. I saw, saw my New Orleans drummer. He's got a day job now. Like, yeah, you know, people are getting jobs. <laughs> that was something I was going to ask you about um, as a full-time professional musician, because somebody, a, lot of, a question I get a lot is, how do you make a living, you know, being a professional musician? And I always laugh and I'm like, man, I got so many side hustles. It's not, you know, even funny. Like I'm not, it's not full-time just musician. The money isn't just like coming in, you know, <laughs> it takes a lot of work. No, it's, it's, it's a hustle, you know, and that's one reason why I think people like that are hustlers were like, oh, Corona, that's just like the tour got canceled or whatever. It's, it was, that's all it was. It was like, all right, let's adapt. I got some shit to sell. We, oh, people are making money doing streams. Cool. Uh, oh, you want me to record in your song? I literally have a great studio where I recorded my new record, Rosewood. It's here. And He's not doing full bands because he, he may have had the corona already, but he's my age and he's just being really careful. Yeah. So he's allowed me to come into the studio and do one-on-one -on -one things with him. So we've been recording and people send me tracks and um, that's been great. Uh, there for a while I was doing some tabla lessons with one student and then, you know, he got busy. So you, you know how it is. You just do everything and you somehow like make your bills. Yeah. And then there's times like where you got a big tour and you're rolling or your tour do, does well. Yeah. But that, that's yeah. my point. Like, like you, like in my mid thirties, I went from having a record deal to like literally doing whatever I could just to eat 
while I was living on a friend's couch. Like yeah. I wasn't, I didn't have money to pay rent in Seattle in 97, you know? So I know what it's like to be broke, but it's sort of a little bit more when you're mid fifties, cause when you're in your twenties, your thirties, you're like big fucking deal. If I got a bag of weed and some beer, I'm fine. Whatever. <laughs> you don't give a damn, but you know, so. Yeah, so it's just you—you're you, just evolving, and you've—you've you've evolved over the time. I mean, shit, you've been doing this for the fuck ever. You've been doing this since the '80s. Um, is that yep. when Billy Goat was around? Yeah. So you just adapt and evolve. Like you—this isn't the first fucking hoorah, you know, or you know. I mean, I lost maybe. everything. To, I lost everything to heroin twice. You know, like sold everything I, I didn't lose it i sold it for very cheap discounted rates at cash america pawn shop on on uh what was that street ross avenue in dallas texas i mean and then once up here in kansas city sold just sold everything it just and you know, so then there's that so if you're a recovering addict like i am then you have that to be grateful for like well i'm clean today yeah. I know what it's like to like not have anything and to be strung out and life completely sucks. Yeah. So I imagine for some people, this is just fucking like been the craziest fucking times in their life to have this thing hit. But um, yeah. Do you have any advice for anybody that, or for the people out there or the struggling musicians that are feeling very affected or depressed and, you know, don't know what to do next? Um, Cause like you said, you've been there, done that. Um, you've struggled. Um, what's, what's some good advice that you could give everybody out there to just keep their heads up and keep going? Well, you know, I've lost a lot of friends to suicide over the years, you know? At this point in my life, I'm, I'm starting to view drug addiction and people that overdose as like an unconscious suicide. It's still suicide in a weird way. It's a slow suicide, but it's almost like you, you, at some point when it's beyond just partying and having fun at the, at the concerts and kicking it, like I have no trips with that. But to me, the, the difference between addiction and just partying is like when the party's over, you go home. But when you're an addict, the party ain't over. Come on, motherfuckers, open up. I need some more shit. Yeah. And when that takes over your life, then you have to do an accounting. And, you know, there's people with greater minds than mine have laid out paths to get back from it. Um, whether it's addiction or just fucking depression. I mean, so many people are depressed right now. Like, like it's a real deal. Like, yeah. I mean, I fight depression. I don't do meds, but some days it's just like, it just, it shows up at your house and it knocks on the door and you did not invite that motherfucker over. You're like, oh, I don't want to see you again. And then it manifests in all these different ways. It can start off with me with anger. Like I can just be, fucking pissed at everything for no reason and then next thing i know i have to force myself to to move to move get out of bed you know yeah so you know being on tour nonstop for me was pretty much just like a way of running and and not dealing with the depression being just like all right i'm just gonna stay busy henry rollins i don't know if he's depressed but he sort of wrote about that just like stay busy all the time you know in his books and for me, it was, it's the same way. Just stay busy all the time so you can't think about how shitty you feel. On you. Yeah, that's exactly what I've been doing for like the past, I guess, month or so. I'm just like, okay, if I just wake up every day and I just concentrate on doing something or I just like pick up my bass and practice or, you know, I do this or do this so I don't have to think about anything else. I could just play with my pig, play with my dogs and play with my bass and then, you know, life's okay. So as long as, yeah, I don't like, and, let those. and that's what you have to do. I mean, you really do. I, I joke, like I, I say, I jog, I practice, I meditate, I eat organic food, you know, 
you know, I, I've done the 12 step thing. I do all this shit. I've done therapy, just hoping to keep my demons from fucking taking it over and putting the needle back in my arm. Like I gotta do all that shit. I gotta stay busy. I, I take top lessons, I practice. I just do all that just so my depression doesn't win. And next thing I know I'm loaded, you know? Like, and you're, it's the same thing. Like you, you have to beat it. it, yeah. it and it's a, it's a battle. Yeah. So my heart goes out to anyone that hurts. I never have judgment on people that, that relapse or people that commit suicide or, you, you know, the, the multitude of the ranges of the illness, like yeah. it's real. And, and someone wrote about someone who's famous, whose daughter died recently. It was like, she got tired of fighting. She, you know, she'd been fighting for so long. She got tired. And that was sort of the, what the father wrote on face on his Instagram thing. And I was like, yeah, that, that really sums it up. You know, like, like the depression, it, it can feel like a fight. For some people, I think you got to get meds, you know, you got to. I mean, I'm, I would probably do better if I got meds. But guess what? Healthcare in America sucks. How are you going to get fucking meds if you ain't got like decent health insurance? Yeah. I mean, how are you going to get a COVID test? I mean, come on. Like, shit's not a hoax. It's like guns. Like, do we need to sit around and argue who invented the fucking gun? All I know is a 20-year-old kid got killed two blocks from me last Sunday. Oh, my God. You know, they shut the street off. And this is, you know, this isn't like fucking they're having people selling drugs on every corner and, and gun battles every day. This is just like a normal old neighborhood where a kid got shot by another kid. Yeah. yeah. And for people who don't know where you guys live, where are you at? Live in Kansas City, Missouri. We uh, rent this old um, building that they turn into apartments. Oh, okay. I thought you were still in NOLA. No, no, no. I moved up here when I hooked up with Peregrine. Oh, I mean, cool. I, just, I really just moved up here recently. I've been going back and forth the whole time. And I let my apartment go right before COVID, a few months before. They sold the building out for me. I had a great apartment. It was cheap and I could afford to keep both. Yeah. But then like when they sold the building, I put all my shit in storage. I just got my shit out of storage and up here in May. Like, like finally when we could travel again, I went down there and got the rest of my stuff. Oh, wow. Some of it to Texas and, and the rest of it back here. You can see all my bunch of shit. And you know, she's a great artist. She has like a giant canvas over there. She's about to do a painting. Look at these birds up here. Paintings all over the wall. Look, look at that. It's one of the ones she did. Can you see that? Oh, super cool. Up a little bit. There you go. Oh, yeah, man. So does it, I guess it helps to have an in-house artist to be married to your graphic designer, huh? Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I have to repay her certain ways. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, there's there's no such thing as free, shall we say? But, uh, I'm wearing uh, one of her designs. This is an old oh, school. Yeah, good on you. Looks no. good on you, girl. Yeah, an old school peregrine design from what? I guess around 2004. That's 2006 when that record came out. Yeah. 2006. Yeah. And then I have another one of her designs. Well, I have a lot of your shirts, but I know she did this one too for you. That one. Yep, that's one of the new ones in the big white skull. She did that right before the last tour. This one? Yeah, that's a little bit more punk rock. That's one of her more punk rock designs. I love that one. And then I have, I'm not sure if she did this one or not, but. We had a friend of mine in uh, West Virginia did that. We were on tour as a flyer, and that was the old Billy Go model right there. The but best shirt ever. Motherfuckers, fuck more, bitch less. I have you on my sign back here. I think I've been blocking it this whole time. Probably can't even see it, but it says, fuck more, bitch less, Magdalene, because that's always been your motto, yeah, from back in the Billy Goat days, um, and that, <laughs> that brings me to a really funny topic. Um, I had a question sent to me wanting to know, is it hard for you to keep your clothes on while you're on stage? That is a great question. <laughs> uh <laughs> The 
first time I took my clothes off on stage was on pre Billy Goat. I was with Tin Hands, and we were playing a gig in Austin on Sixth Street at the Old Ritz. It was like this. They did all kinds of show, like Gigi Allen played there, like everything from punk rock to like Tin Hands, the band I was in. And I remember we ate a bunch of acid right before the show. Me and my buddy who I went to high school with and lived there, and. During the gig, it came on really strong, and I was just like out of control. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know that acid feeling. It was probably my third time to take acid, and the next thing I know, I'm behind my congas playing naked because clothes felt completely restricted. <laughs> and and then all of a sudden, like, I couldn't play, and I was like, the only way I got through that gig was like thinking, well, man, if those guys in the Grateful Dead can play on acid. I can fucking play on acid. Like literally I had to like channel, even though I wasn't a deadhead, I had to channel like, I was like, other guys could play drums on acid too. Those drummers in the dead took acid. All right, just play, you'll be fine. So, <laughs> then uh, finally I was like starting to party too much and I got kicked out of Tin Hands for being a crazy lunatic. <laughs> Man, you share similar stories. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're all my friends. They're still my friends. But you know how it is when everyone in their 20s, you know, I was partying a little bit too much. And <laughs> I hit the manager one day. And he's a good friend of mine still. Love him. But <laughs> Mike. You know, and, 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 and Tin Hands was more like a Frank Zappa, Peter Gabriel meets Talking Heads meets just weird Texas 80s into the 90s kind of band. More of a pop band with cool sensibilities. But I was like into the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Bad Brains and Fishbone and Beastie Boys and you know all that cool music coming out of the late 80s. So I started Billy Goat. And the first rehearsal we had, I remember we wrote Chef Boyardee, Fuck More Bitch Less, <laughs> Leche Leche Come Bedlasaurus. In my past life, I was a dinosaur. And like, everybody take your clothes off. So at the first rehearsal, you know, I'm like 23, yeah, 23 with my clothes off, dancer, no, yeah, 24, it was 89. Dancing naked, singing the song, and everyone's just laughing, like, ah! <laughs> it was like one of the first songs we wrote, and the first gig we did, that was the last song we did, and I got naked, and there was no YouTube, it just spread by word of mouth. And like the third show we had, we had gone from being the opening band to be in the headlining band and this was in dallas and within like six months we're opening for the ghetto boys yeah <laughs> at trees playing to 600 people and willie d is stage diving during our set and we're opening for 24 7 spies and the drummer from billy goat from tin hands switched with the billy goats drummer earl harvin joined billy goat and then we got a record deal and we we're touring the country opening for primus you know in 1990 and I remember we opened for 311 and the urge at fucking a giant place in Salt Lake in like 93. And you know, it's a 5,000 Mormon kids or whatever the fuck they are. <laughs> and I got naked at that show. Oh my God, you did not. I did. And we were like the opening band. <laughs> and it just freaked all those people out. They're like, ah, naked man on stage. <laughs> Oh my God, dude. Like, I remember, like, that's what you were known for. Like, every time Mike Dillon was coming into town, we would always make sure we are going to taunt you until this motherfucker takes his pants off and starts playing his fucking congas with his motherfucking penis. Like, yeah. it was a thing. Well, I used to do that during Billy Goat. I can remember, like, touring and, like, like, we had to do a night drive one time. We pulled over to truck stop. And I fucking like went into pee and like I'm pissing blood. I'm like, what the fuck? And it's because I played a Tim Bali solo with my dick. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, it was just like regular shit like all the time. Like the first time I ran into Fishbone, not the first time, but I was talking to Angelo at the hurricane in Kansas City. I was like, yo, Angelo. You know, I worship Fishbone. Still do to these days. And I was like, I'm in the band Billy Goat. And he goes, ah, y'all that naked band. I'm like, <laughs> you know, so it's sort of a curse too, because no one, we were just the naked band, you know? Yeah. And we made good music, but pe critics hated us, like the Dallas Morning News and the Dallas Observer critic 
Robert Wolanski was this, he was decent to me because he knew I could play music. And, but he would write things like Mike Dillon, a steam percussionist who went to North Texas State and played in the one o'clock, could have done anything in music he wanted to, but instead he takes his clothes off with Billy Goat. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard it here first, folks. It pays to take your clothes off. Well, I don't know. <laughs> so we got a record deal. If I would have just been into taking my clothes off, everything would have been fine. You know, I could have been like, well, one day you'll be 55 and you'll be worrying about how you're paying your rent. But if you play the game and just do drugs ever now and then and focus on your career like you're going to want to when you're in your 50s, maybe you'll make some money, you know? Like that's the only thing I've learned as far as like, if you're a young band and you want to party, hire a good tour manager that makes sure your ass never missed a gig. A good tour manager that scores you drugs. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, I'm saying like, that's the only thing I've learned in all these years, the difference between bands that are super successful and bands that were good, but sort of blew up because of the drug use. Yeah. Um, you know, there's some cases where like Lane Staley from Alice in Chains, I mean, he, I, there was no control in him. He was like full on there. But you know, I, I've heard just, you know, like there were other bands that the record labels were like, oh, we bought them needles when they came to town to make sure that they made the fucking gig. I ain't gonna say what band I'm talking about, yeah. but some famous bands that we all love, Sure. you know, they, they showed up for their shit and didn't miss it. You know, and, and Billy Goat, we fucked up too much. We had a lot of big chances and I would fucking miss gigs doing drugs in the bathroom for three days straight. Yeah. You, know, you do that long enough, you lose your fan base. People stop taking you serious. And then all of a sudden you're like having to rebuild your career. But you know, it was fun. I don't regret it all. I'm working on a book and it's gonna be a damn good book. It's gonna be like told from almost like you know, everyone that writes books, they're usually super famous people that are like, well, and I was on tour and I did drugs and I met, <laughs> I met this famous actress and we made a baby and blah, blah, blah. And then we got a divorce because we're famous people and we live in Hawaii and blah, 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 or whatever. But mine's gonna be like, I've lived in a van for 30 years and I've been on tour playing sinky bars and pissing in shitty bathrooms and, <laughs> But damn, these are some good times. And one time I met this, this awesome bass player lady, super fine mom with tattoos named Sunshine Cantu. And yeah. Yeah, and it was That's all funny. over after that. Christy, motherfucker. Um, yeah, a running joke with mom. My mom is just a, your number one fan, obviously. And she is just so in love with you and in her head. She thinks that we're going to get married someday and have children. And I'm like, Mom, okay, he's married, and the baby factory's been closed. You're going to be the fourth wife. <laughs> my shit. You're number four. So that, that's what this whole thing is about, just to let your mom that know you like, we're patient. Oh, my God. <laughs> Dude, but um, I want to fucking bring up, so that one night you played her birthday party, and you were so kind, because I think you were just like, you happened to be in Texas, and you had like a couple of days off, and you were staying at Mama D's up in, uh, where are you at? You're at a, in Taylor, right? Or? Rosebud. Where's Rosebud. that? Rosebud. Rosebud. Um, and uh, you, so you got a band together and you drove down to Corpus. And at the time I had a taco truck. It was the, inter the intergalactic taco ship. Awesome. I forgot about that. Yeah. And so I would change, I would rotate the menu every time that we'd have a different band. And so I made like a whole Mike Dillon inspired menu for you. And it was funny because I haven't eaten meat in, you know, over 20 something years, but I always put like one meat dish on the um on the menu but for this particular night everything was vegetarian because you're vegetarian or you were vegetarian at the time i don't know if you're still vegetarian or not <clears throat> party on some fish now you party on some fish um but that night was so hilarious because my mom was so excited that mike dylan was playing her birthday party you know we had the taco truck going and so she met you know she moseys her way up to the stage you know and you're playing and thank god all this is on youtube because i'm gonna have to put the link so everybody can see and mom like 
somehow manages to grab your hand like while you're like playing right and you have like one fucking um a mallet that you're playing with and my mom's like holding your hand and she's like you know just won't let you go and i'm like oh my god and then you said something about coke dick and my mom's like what's coke dick and everybody like turns around and my and you're like Somebody, somebody tell Sunshine Mom what Coke Dick is. And I'm just like, oh my God, of course this is my mom's birthday party. Like, what the fuck is going on right now? <laughs> that is pretty funny. I forgot about that. There was a period there where I was obsessed with Coke Dick. <laughs> Fucking Mike, dude, you cracked Okay, me up. so but anyway, back to the getting naked thing. <laughs> Coke Dick is not fun to get naked with. No, um... <laughs> um <laughs> so like pretty much though after billy goat we stopped getting naked every now and then the hairy apes we would get naked if it was really a good night but by hairy apes we're like we're gonna focus on the music there's no getting naked and then go go jungle like there were a few nights that we got naked and oh yeah mike deep probably just in corpus because you were there <laughs> you know, egging it on but <laughs> But eventually you get to the point where you're like, 40 year old men don't need to be walking around naked in public, no matter how good you think your body is. I was you know about to say, but you got a pretty bomb body. I'm doing good for my age and you know, 50, at 54, I'll be 55 next month. You know, I'm not like Iggy skinny, but um, I don't think that dude eats nothing but like broccoli or something. But, <laughs> You know, I still like to eat pancakes, but yeah. I go work out every other day so that if I decide to get naked, I can get naked and not be too ashamed, but. Oh God, shut up, oh my God, dude. I remember your morning routine used to be, I think you would like have either an espresso or your coffee, then you'd go for like a mile run and then you'd come home, four mile run, and then you'd come home and you'd practice your tablas for like an hour or so. That's it. That's what I'm gonna do after I get off the show today. Is that still what you? Is that still pretty much your routine? My favorite routine to do: play tabla in the morning, and I still take tabla lessons. Play tabla in the morning, go for a run tomorrow. That's what I'll do. Can you tell us about your tabla men, your tabla mentor? His name is Alok Dutta. He's a great teacher. He lives in Los Angeles. He taught Danny Carey from Tool. He was his teacher, still is. Um, he's taught a lot of great drummers the music of tabla, and I've been studying with him since 2002. And he's just made me such a be better musician. And literally, I can do things on tabla that I never thought I'd be able to do. It just seemed like the craziest mm. drumming. How could you ever do that? Yeah. And, and he's a great teacher. And, that's all. That's the main thing I've been doing in, during COVID. Besides, I've got 29 new songs recorded. Oh, shit. I got a new record that came out called Rosewood. But I have um, 29 songs recorded. I'll probably do a couple more. But they're already pretty much at mixing level. We're already mixing them. And we'll probably release them initially on Bandcamp in a couple of months. Uh-huh. Start and put them out on vinyl once all this pandemic is uh we figured out a way to tour again to sell records so that is i guess one perk of being home is that you have a lot of time to just invest all of it into making and creating new music yeah it's so exciting like because i remember when we when i had a record deal in the 90s and we did a record with billy got recorded with jerry harrison from the talking heads he was our producer i just didn't get how lucky I was to be making a record, spending a month recording, and then take a Christmas break, and then mix. Like I was there for the whole process, there every day, but I just didn't know enough about studio life back then. And you just sort of thought it was always gonna be that way, like you have a record deal. But even back then, the record, for me, making records was so that you could tour and rock out. Yeah. I to make, make a record that rocked. It's got to be badass and rock. And nowadays it's like, I love it when it rocks and I love it when it gets soft and beautiful. Yeah. But, and I know so much more about how to record and, and to write music. That's the main thing. Like, 
back then it was like, I just wrote the lyrics and played percussion, but now I write all the music. So nice. I just love writing music. So that's really where I'm at. Just using this time to get better as a songwriter. Now, I know you've done scores before for movies. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's an amazing process when you just get the, uh, the raw footage and then you start like coming up with ideas based on what's going on. And sometimes I'll use some pre-material, you know, the promoter, the producer of the movie would be like, I like that one song you had, can we use that? But everything else I want new. Yeah. They, they license one super famous song, they had the money for one song. So a lot of the movies I've worked on are like, you know, smaller budget things. But like the, the, the most recent one was the Karma Bombs about these four or five cats from California who flew to India and jumped on their paddle boards and went down the Ganges River. And it's really a pretty astounding movie. They were sick. One person got like either cholera or dysentery and like was really sick and like bad fever and like just from riding in the middle of a bunch of poop on a river. Oh my God. They, they call oh my God. Destroyers. So, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, so basically, that's how you. That's how it's done. They send you the footage, and then you you put your music to the flow of the of the movie. Yeah, that that that's the most recent one I've done. Um, you know, some other movies I've been involved with. I wasn't say the main. Um, composer for the movie, but I, I remember like my friend Tim DeLauder, he sent from Polyphonic Spree, he sent me this clip of who's that famous guy now, Zach something, the comedian. Oh, uh, Zach Z Z uh, Zelikonofkis or something like that. <laughs> so I, I didn't even know who he was, but they sent me, I remember like they sent me the clip and they already had a bunch of music, but the polyphonic spree was like composing for that film and they needed percussion. So I was doing the percussion and sort of, it was like an ambient kind of scene or whatever. Yeah. I remember that was like the first time I saw that dude. I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> and then like, you know, Billy Goat, we, we were on a Polly Shore movie and that was like, they put Chef Boyardee. So that was just like, we sent him a song. Really? What movie was it? Son-in-law. No way. Yeah, man, I made thirty thousand dollars, and because I had such a drug addiction, I didn't. I saw like two hundred dollars of it. I owed someone twenty people, including our manager, money. Oh my god. Record label money. I mean, literally, I don't think we. I just remember like, yep, y'all got an advance, and yep, the man, my manager, saying it's all going. It's 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 accounted for. Oh shit. <laughs> so you've learned, you've learned over the years how to uh, battle those demons or actually we battle them every day when we wake up, don't we? Well, you sort of surrender to the fact that you have, uh, you're an addict. And then once you surrender, it's not so much a battle, but the part for me that's the battle, I look at it like, like, like just training. Like, <laughs> like you're just like in training to kick this, the beast ass. Yeah. You know? You surrender to the fact, though, that you're an addict and you can't, for me, I can't drink. If I, I start with, if I drink, eventually I'm going to fuck up and do something evil. That's been the hardest one for me to accept because I was never a beer addict. But once I start drinking beers, there's a good chance I'm going to find the bad shit. Yeah. So a lot of people are able to be like, I'm never doing the hard shit ever again. I'm just going to be weed for the rest of my life. Fucking weed somewhere along the way started making me turn into a paranoid little gerbil in the corner of the room. Oh, just shit. Going, ah! I remember we were on a Harry Apes tour. I smoked a bunch of weed coming down from a binge. I was just in the back of the van, and Zach, our key first keyboardist, turned around and goes, What's wrong with you, Mike? It's only fucking weed. <laughs> it was like a psychedelic near death experience. <laughs> 
dude. Oh, that was like me when I went to my cousin's. I hadn't smoked like for probably a month and my cousin was trying to show me up and he's like, oh, I'm going to give you a dab. And, you know, they're always like, I'm just going to give you a little dab. And he gives me this huge ass dab. And oh my God, I was stuck on the couch for like the rest of the day. And I'm normally like so used to smoking. You know, I don't have a problem with it. And it completely like put me up. And my pig's being a lunatic right now. What, is that him behind me? We've been talking for a long time. This is awesome. <laughs> my pig is crazy. He just brought himself in and he closed the door behind him. That's great. Oh, what's that? Yes, do you hear him? Oh my God, let me see. Oh. There was a man from Dallas called the Loco Gringos back in the day. All they right. were, they had a song go, Nurture my pig. <laughs> he covered it. Um, could you tell me a little bit about your relationship with um, Les Claypool? Um, Les is one of the baddest motherfuckers to ever walk the planet. And Jesus, I freaking, you know. Just keep talking. I'm going to go let my pig out really quick, but I'm going to let you keep talking while I do that, okay? You know, Les, uh, I've been playing with him for a while now, and he always comes up with cool projects. And I'm, I'm glad that he's included me on several of them, including most recently, Bastard Jazz. Uh, but Les is one of those uh, amazing uh, musicians. He's a great writer. Like, that's what I love about Les. That's what stands out about him is his songwriting, the stories he tells. And then he's an amazing virtuosic bassist, as we all know. But the way he plays bass even when he's playing like crazy, insane, fast shit, it's a song. Like the dude just composes at a hyper critical warp speed. Yeah. So <laughs> like with Bastard Jazz, the last few gigs I've done with him, it's all just improv. He might go into a bit of Tommy the Cat or, or whatever Primus song he just quotes for his fans that are there. Yeah. But it's done completely different. But most of the time, it's just off the cuff, and, and it always goes somewhere. He's so fun to play with. Yeah. And, and how did you meet him? Uh, I met him uh, through Skerrick. You know, Skerrick, yes. who was bugging in Dead Kenny G's and Garage of Toa. Badass saxophone player for anybody who may not know who Skerrick <laughs> is. Look him up. Um, yeah, he was playing with him, and I think the Malachi Papers – my Kansas City group that I had for years, starting in the 90s, where I first started playing Vibes, we were opening for left. You know, it was just like through the jam band scene. Skerrick was playing with him, so I'd come by and say, hey, after our gigs. Once I was in – so that was like – yeah, that was the summer when we opened for him of 2001 in Cincinnati. And I sat in with him, and it was super fun. And – it was almost like we, we, we just connected right away rhythmically. Like we had a good connection. And then I was playing with Carl Denson New Year's Eve 2001 in San Francisco. And less than those guys were playing over at the Fillmore. I was at the Warfield Galactic and Carl Denson. So as soon as I was done with my Carl D set, I hauled ass over with some drums and just sat in with less. Yeah. At at New Year's Eve and ripped it up. And then he called me in a few days later. I was like, hey, you want to um, come out here and record with me at Rancho Relaxo? And so Mike and Skerrick went out and recorded with him and we all hung out. And that's when we made the uh, Purple Onion record. Wow. That was January 2002. And um, then the next thing I know, I went on tour. Um, I was on tour with Carl and then Les had a spring tour. He offered it to me. So I had to leave the Carl D band to go play with my pal Les. And you know, Carl plays with the Rolling Stones now. And I love Carl D, man. He's such a great player. And you know, he was a really cool band leader. You know, I left the band and still all these years later, I'll go play with him sometimes at Jazz Fest or if there's a festival or at a, or a jam cruise. And I played on one of his last records. So, you know, it's been a great thing being where music has come from the days of insanity and youth and punk rock and funk and 
drugs and getting naked to like really focusing on the music yeah. and, and, and meeting some cool people along the way and having fun. Yeah, I still have uh, my backstage pass for the after party for the um, Austin show. Oh it was, God, that was yeah. Yeah, so I wanted to show that to you. That was the, la the last tours we did with, the, with his solo project. Then he put Primus back together. That was I Remember Let's we all sat on the bus. Yeah. Sorry, I was going to say that I'm was the fungi, was that the fungi and faux band? No, uh, I thought it was the uh, the fancy band with uh, oh, Gabby Lala. Yeah, we're pretty fancy. Yeah, so you played in multiple of his groups, right? The Flying Frog Brigade. Yeah, the fancy band, the front, front, and then he had the fungi and faux band. And then I did the Primus Willy Wonka tour with him. Oh, I bet that was fun. Chocolate Factory, I played Malice for that tour. They would do an old school Primus set first, and then a cello mm -hmm. player, and I would come out and augment the Primus, the mighty Primus. And then the most recent thing has been Bastard Jazz. So. So that's just his new, that's his new side project? Yeah, that, Les always has, he's so creative, he always has a lot of things going on. I guess they started doing Oyster Head. They were supposed to be doing Oyster Head this year. And then the Claypool Linen Delirium's awesome. Super mm. psychedelic and it's like Primus with Sean Lennon or something. It's not Primus, it's Claypool and Sean Lennon. It's incredible. Yeah, wow. I remember the first time I saw him, I was like, wow. It's, it's eerie hearing Sean sing. You know, I was a fan of Sean's solo records. Um, yeah, Carly and Adam, used, they were big fans of Chivo Mato and and Sean, and they would play his music in the band. So. so Les is pretty good at like making concept albums and concept bands and things like that nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that idea. I always like, I, I've always loved the um, concept albums and those kinds of things that like focus around a main theme or a, a main story. And I know that uh, Les is really good at that. <clears throat> so, yeah, that was definitely something I wanted to talk with you about, just because I know everybody out there want, you know, everybody's all, less, 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 um, obviously, because he's amazing. So, um, and I know you've spent a lot, a lot of time with him on the road. So I just wanted to kind of ask you about that. Yeah, um, super uh, inspiring human being. And he's funny as hell, too. So that's a nice thing. Yeah, I remember when I saw you guys one time, um, in Austin at Stubbs, I think it was. Uh, and he had his kids come up on stage and they were wearing like monkey masks and, and like running around and stuff. Yep. Yeah, it was really cute. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, I know I remember seeing you at Voodoo Fest one year um, in New Orleans. And I think it was at, I can't remember what bar, but I mean, I think you played till like four in the morning or some shit like that. Like it was so crazy. That was Go-Go Jungle Voodoo Fest after party. Yes, those were good times. Like, like that was usually like the one time a year where there could be some nakedness post Billy Goat was like Jazz Fest at Le bon Ton at six in the morning. I definitely tried to get you naked that night too. Well, it was me and Gina. It wasn't just me. So I'm gonna uh, put a shout out to my sister out there. <laughs> What's up, Gina? <laughs> Gina, she's on the front lines fighting the COVID, man. Bless her heart. Yeah, she is. And she's, you know, it's really hard for, for the healthcare workers out there too. Cause I think they're really struggling with a lot of depression and a lot of like angst and don't really know how to deal with their emotions and their, you know, where to put their energy and stuff. So. They're, they're heroes. Yeah, man. It's been hard on everybody. It fucking, it's a fucking trip. But um, I don't want to take up too much of your time. We've almost been on here for about an hour. Um, it's been an hour with my girl, Sunshine. I know. I miss you. I wish I could give you big hugs. Oh, my gosh. Soon. Um, I'll have to go visit you in Peregrine. So what you got to do is Peregrine says she wants you to come out here to KC eventually. So when the corona's over and we all feel good about it, uh, you'll come out and Go Go Ray lives here in Kansas City. <laughs> and we'll have to do a Sunshine 
Go Go Ray Mike D reunion. Yes, dude, that would be so much fun. I'm so down. Oh my gosh, I haven't seen. Last time I saw Go Go Ray, he played here in Santa Cruz with uh, he was playing with uh, Samantha Fish. Yeah, that's who he was playing with. Yeah, um, Go -Go's awesome. We're gonna do a live stream at the end of the month. The last one we did with him, same deal. My camera worked good, but I was like, okay, we have a drummer and. Um, I'm going to mic everything up and use my little bitty PA and send it through the computer. Uh, not a good idea not to have a sound man doing that because when he would start playing loud, just the whole mix distorted or same thing if I start playing loud, you know, people are like, just blowing up. Beer was like, ah, oh, this is horrible. It sounds like dead. <laughs> so sorry, you guys. So we're, we're going to hire my buddy Chad, who I record with, to do sound. Yeah, I think it's definitely like a, um, a learning process for everybody. That, that's one thing that I didn't ask you about was uh, your beginnings and um, how you got into music and who your influences were. I did want to um, ask you about that real quick before we go. Well, being like 10 years old in 1975, you got to like hear Led Zeppelin as they were releasing music on the radio, you know, like Led Zeppelin was huge. I mean, like everything, like album radio was great. You know, I can remember here in Boston, like that record was so huge and buying that record, buying Led Zeppelin 4, you know, buying like Blue Oyster Cult records, you know, Godzilla, I love that song. And then discovering Kiss, you know, <laughs> this was all like 10 years old, like walking to the record store with lawnmower money and buying records, buying Queen a night at the opera, like, you know, just buying these records and then like falling in love with records and the whole idea of going to the music store, to the record store and buying records. It was so exciting. And, you know, AM radio was awesome. And, and I was always like, even when I was like six or seven year old, hearing Smokey Robinson, hearing the Jackson five, like, like when we take drives with my family, you know, we lived in Corpus when I was a kid. Then we moved up to, in, to, to the Dallas area. And then back to Corpus. And to I hate to interrupt you, but dude, Corpus is the common denominator here. I swear. Like I've met all of some, like most of my bestest friends, like because of like the South Texas area. I'm telling you. And, I, and, it, and when I started going back to Corpus and, and hanging with you and it was just, I, I loved it. But I can remember being like young, wanting to play drums. And I started off on trombone and about by Christmas time, I destroyed my trombone and switched to drums. Wait, so did you really start on the trombone? I really did. And I really literally destroyed it so bad that for the Christmas concert, I played bells <laughs> as a little 10 year old kid. And then like that summer after fifth grade, I got a drum set. My neighbor had one and I mowed enough yards that they sold it to me for like 50 bucks. 50 bucks when you're 10 years old, because my old man was like, you want drums, you got to earn them. There's that lawnmower, so I'd walk around and, hi, can I mow your yard? <laughs> I can only imagine being a 10 year old now and going around neighborhoods with lawnmowers. I guess they still do that shit, but I mowed a lot, a lot of lawns. And back then, you know, you, you, you went outside and you came home at dark. That was the rules. I don't think kids get to do that now. I think everyone's so, with re good reason, you know, there's a lot of fucking predators out there. Yeah. They're more careful with their kids now. But in 1975, you know, 1971, I just remember running around, just running ape shit crazy and was into skateboarding. And then once I discovered drums, that sort of took over for everything. Then I took a little break for football but then I got into Rush and started getting into like prog rock in the middle of high school. And I, it, it reignited my flame to be a drummer and I haven't let up. And that was 1982. I haven't stopped since then. Oh, wow. And um, tell me about your mom's involvement. Cause I know that she loves to like go on the road with you a lot and she goes to most of your shows. Yeah, Vera from the beginning when I told her I wanted to play drums, she was a high school teacher. Or my dad was a high school football coach and Vera was a junior high teacher. He got me a really good band director. She got the band director to find me a good private teacher. Like, what? so I was taking private lessons at a young age and 
she's always supported my musical stuff. And then somewhere along the road, along, especially after my father passed, she just started like, she would show up everywhere. Like the last <laughs> few years, she'd be like, all right, you're gonna be here, I'll see you there. You know, some nights, like I remember the craziest thing she did was like, we were trying, we had a Nola Tet tour and we were supposed to play in Santa Fe and all the flights out of New Orleans were canceled. This is like three years ago, four years ago. So the only way half the band would make it was like, she was gonna, she, I don't know what the fuck she did. She drove all the way to Santa Fe in like a day. <laughs> it's like, all right, I'll meet you there. She drove there. She picked me up at the airport and got me to the gig from Albuquerque to Santa Fe. I missed the first set. And then she like drove home. Like, you know, she's a driving machine. Yeah, I had to bring that up because uh, every time I've been to one of your shows and I've been to many, 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 many of your shows, Mama's always there. So I had to go, I have to give a shout out to Mama D because she's the real OG and she is like the tour manager, man. She's the one getting you to where you need to go. Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's like people are like, how do you drive so much? I'm like, it's just in my genetic pool. <laughs> my DNA information, Vera. <laughs> but my grandfather drove all the time and, and Vera can drive me under the table. Oh, really? She's superior. I mean, I don't know how she does it. Like, she will literally, like, leave Texas at 2 in the morning and drive straight to Chicago and be pouring in at 7 o'clock the next day. I mean, back in 2016, she did that, had a stroke two days later, and thank God she was with my sister and no lasting effects. But three days later, she was like, I flew up to Chicago and drove her home. Yeah. But I was so wimpy. I was like, no, nah, we're getting a hotel halfway. <laughs> and um, that, that's what we did. But the doctor was like, you're going to have to stop driving, doing these long drives. She, said, she still drives straight to Chicago. I can't do that. She's 77 now. And your mom is so badass. I love you, Mama D. Oh, love my God. You're right. Uh, cool, man. I'm going to start wrapping this up. I don't have not been able to keep up with any of these questions. So I apologize to anybody out there that wants to talk to Mike. I guess you'll have to go through me. Um, <laughs> Are there questions that people want to know? Um, I'm trying to keep up with them and I'm having a hard time getting and I don't want to open my Facebook back up. So, um, I think that I'm going to start wrapping it up. Oh, oh, I did have one more question. How can we support you through all this? Like, what's the best way to support Mike Dillon and the Mike Dillon band? Yeah, human beings have been awesome supporting me. Um, so, you know, my Venmo is super easy. Mike dash Dillon dash band. Can't say dash. You know, that's an easy one. Or go just buy some music, you know. There's uh, my new records at uh, royalpotatofamily.com. You can get it from my label. Or you can Facebook me and I'll send you a record. I got CDs. Uh, I have some more vinyl too coming in on Thursday. So we got a couple of t We mainly got like, I got, I'm pretty much nearly out of t-shirts. So you Ooh, want to you stock up. Yeah, I need to order more, but I sent, I sent you the last of them. Ha <laughs> ha! They're mine. Nobody's taking them away. Um, I, got left. I got I got two of these ones um, in mint That's condition. Incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, cool. So your website, I guess. Um, dude, I was looking at your discography. You have like, how many albums do you have out? I don't even know. But I know right now, tonight, I did a nine CDs for $50 deal. I'll send oh. you of my cds that i have in stock this is a good deal guys or three for 20 and that includes the new one rosewood 
Rosewood, I know that I shared the write up on um, Sunshine and the Base Kids. If you guys have not read that write up, please go read that. It was a fantastic article written about Mike Dillon's new album that was just released. Um, and it has really, really, really rave reviews. Um, and you guys should go out there and purchase that and support this amazing artist that has been fucking doing it since goddamn 1982. <laughs> I'm composing the soundtrack for Sunshine and the Bass Kids. Yeah, I need I need the soundtrack. Um, who's your puppet maker? This is beautiful. That's real beautiful. Thank you. That's the great thing about this place is a piano. So I can like write on piano, or I can write on my vibes, whatever I want to write on. Um, one last question before we go. I've noticed in your live streams you have little puppet friends. Who's your puppet maker? The puppet maker. <laughs> the puppet maker. Well, Peregrine is the puppet mistress. And the puppet thing started because we were talking about the live stream. The first live stream was not that good. In fact, it sort of sucked. <laughs> and then I came downstairs for the next live stream. And Peregrine said, look, you have an audience. I said, I do. And that's how the puppets came about. <laughs> I needed an audience because I need personal gratification when I play. So <laughs> puppets would clap. <laughs> yeah, so Peregrine had all these puppets around. Oh my God. <laughs> but they were like old puppets, like Mr. Rogers style puppets. Like, like literally like she could sell them on eBay and make more money than my live streams make. <laughs> She's holding on to them, baby. You need a show. You got it. You need to have your audience, you know? Yeah, so it was just sort of like, it was basically like, I was like, yeah, it's weird playing your phone. So we started making the puppets be the audience. It was sort of hilarious. Then, uh, but what's really funny is Beignet, you know, he's about the size of a puppet. But oh he, my goodness. He's been on me the whole time. So he loves his music. He sees me come over here and the really loud music just like we were on tour last summer and I remember Paragon was like, take Beignet with you. And I was like, well, uh, it's summer and what am I going to do when we're playing? Can't leave a puppy in the car. The puppy police will come and break your windows and take your puppy. Well, take a cage and just take him inside. So I'm in Eugene, Oregon and we're it's no Latet trio, so we're not super loud. But then again, everything I do can get loud at some point. <laughs> so I'm, look, I'm playing drums, and he's in a little puppy cage right behind the bass speaker. And even though it's upright bass, James starts doing something he's like, with the bow going super loud. <laughs> and, and the piano player, Brian Haas, is looking at me going, Mike, Beignet, he's about to come bust. I look at Beignet, he has stood up and he's like making this weird sound like all five pounds of him to like blow up and there's gonna be little pieces of Beignet all over the scene. So I just jump off the drums and I go take him to the back. And then like, so Beignet's only five pounds but he's a very loud chirping dog. Next thing I know from the back, he's just like, meh, meh, meh. let's do this. Beignet was really loud, so then I was like, all right, the sun's gone down, it's cool outside, I'll leave the windows cracked. I'm gonna go put you inside, but don't be chirping in the van. So I just go put him in, he's got his little blanket in there and he just hung out, you know, so. 
that's Beignet on tour. Beignet, and then when I drive, Beignet sits on my lap the whole way. And like, like Peregrine says, he's her emotional support dog. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> my emotional support dog. I'm a really insane person. And, and literally like Ben Ye walks around the house. If I start to freak out, he comes and calls on me. Like this summer or a few months back, I was like cleaning out the disposal. Something was in it. And I had my left hand in and the water running, trying to get out what was jammed. And instead of turning the water off, I hit the disposal when my hand was in it. And it hurt so bad. I was like, ah! And I went running. And Beignet, instead of freaking out, he came on me and jumped on my back. I was looking at my face to make sure I was OK. Oh. My hands are so rough. My hands were tougher than a disposal. They Dude, were very sore for a few days. And I think the disposal was dull. I, it was a few years old. So I lucked out and I pulled it out just in time, but didn't lose any fingers. Holy shit, dude. That is like a fucking your worst nightmare come true. Oh, it's like putting your hand through a saw. Like, have you <gasps> seen uh, tours, Tales from the Tour Bus? Uh-uh. Mike Judge. It's go, if you don't have HBO streaming, I, I don't know, just, just Google Tours from the Tail Bus. Okay. Watch one season. And it's about the country western guys. You know, it's about Waylon, fucking Billy Joe Shaver, whose birthday I think is today or yesterday. He just turned 81. Mer uh, not Merle Haggard, although he gets mentioned in there plenty in the Waylon episodes. Um, yeah. No. Um, so anyway, who else is on there? Jerry Lee Lewis, George, George Jones. Oh, my God. <laughs> Good stories. Good stories. Johnny Paycheck. The first season starts off with Mike Judge, whoever it is on the tour bus, going, so while most of America is freaked out and Congress is having hearings on whether hip-hop artists like NWA are inciting violence and talking about guns, Billy, Johnny Paycheck was on trial for shooting another man in a bar. Oh, shit. It starts off, like, Actually, shoot. So what I learned by watching the country western stars, <laughs> like most of the country western guys had guns and shot other people with them at their height of their fame. <laughs> they switched from drinking nonstop to doing tons of cocaine, and shit got crazy. Dude, they, they are hardcore. Like the Towns Van Zandt documentary, like that motherfucker, he had so much fucking money, but he was just so addicted to the high that like he fucking like still lived in the trailer park. Like he spent all his cash or whatever the fuck. But he literally went to sleep sniffing fucking uh, super glue. And when he woke up, it was like stuck, you know, stuck to his mouth and they had to like fucking like get it off and shit. But I'm like, dude, that's some hardcore fucking shit. Oh man, he was such a great songwriter and so, so. Yeah. You know, I've stayed at the, the Van Zandt Hotel with Ricky Lee and Austin over there on Lake Austin, fancy sushi hotel. I'm just like, this is the opposite of Towns Van Zandt. Shooting <laughs> fucking or dope. I don't know if he shot or not, but dope fiend. I imagine he did. He was a dope fiend motherfucker. Dude, but he was a badass fucking songwriter. He fucking, a lot of people don't know he wrote uh, Poncho and Lefty. Everybody thinks that Willie Nelson wrote that, and that's yeah, actually a Tom Spencer. song. I love that song. I mean, like, Bob Dylan would would come to Austin and want Towns to hang out with him. It's Tom, crazy. No, nah, I don't want to hang out with you, Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, those country western dudes were hardcore. I think it's Texas. It's something about us Texas folk. I'll tell you what, man. We fucking don't fuck around. Nope. Yeah. Mer uh, I mean, like, Waylon Jennings was in Buddy Holly's band. Oh, shit. I couldn't do that. Yeah. Waylon Jennings was supposed to get on that plane with Buddy and the Big Bopper. You know? And Richie wow. Valley. But guess what? Big Bopper was sick. Waylon was like, oh, you can take my seat, bro. I know you're not feeling good. And this bus ride's long. The heater's broke. It's going to be freezing. It's the middle of winter. So he gave up his seat. Look what happened. Yeah. Uh, That's crazy. Do you crazy. imagine you have Waylon Jennings music? 
Can I imagine what? Music without Waylon Jennings. Oh, the, fuck what? no, dude. Dude, he's the fucking... He's the boss. Fucking outlaw, man. I love all that shit. So anyway, check out that show. You'll love it. Tales oh, on the tour bus. Tales You'll on the tour bus. And that all came about because somebody cut their finger off or what? <laughs> Billy Joe Shaver did cut off his finger, but the episode on him is amazing. It talks about it like... Um, and Towns Van Zandt is mentioned in the last... Uh, because they talk about that dude Foley, who was an awesome musician and never got famous. And that one's super amazing that, you know, A Drunken Angel, that song by Lucinda Williams, uh -huh. the guy who that song's about, they do the last episode on him. And he was an awesome guy. You got to watch it. It's incredible. Yeah, no, I definitely will. I've been uh, oh, trying to get a documentary. Oh, yeah. Everybody go watch the Towns Van Zandt documentary. That's it's such a fucking good documentary. Um sick dude thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to um talk to me and and just kind of hang out and chat chit chat with me well we've been needing to catch up so people got to wa witness our catch up i know <laughs> um i can't wait till we are um able to like you know get going again and start touring and and start doing our thing but until then um you know i guess we'll just keep recording songs and i actually still have fucking like two or three songs that you tracked for me that i haven't released yet like you did you yeah do i think it was like back in fucking um like four years ago or some shit like that but uh dude i got some fire fire ass tracks from you um so i'm excited to release those <laughs> I wondered if you ever released those. Yeah. Oh no, I'd have tagged you. Don't worry about that. You'll you'll be tagged and and all that. So, uh, yeah, man, I love you so much, and thank you for everything. I love you too. Goodbye, Facebook world. We'll see you the next time on Facebook world. Facebook. <laughs> Facebook. Facebook, Facebook world. All right. I love you. We'll see you next time. Bye.